Welcome to Sunday night on Assassin 99.5 here in Accra, 98.5 in Kumasi, 99.7 in Tamale, and 100.3 if you're in Cape Coast. Uh, and you can also be picking up on us globally, watching us streaming on Facebook, and later on YouTube on Asase XTRA, Asase Extra. Today, we're the guests of somebody whom I've been dying to meet now for the better part of 20 years. The designer, Kwesi Inti, who's kindly invited us here to his showroom in East Spagon. Who's Kwesi Inti? Well, if you haven't been anywhere near Ghana for the past 30 years, it might be possible that you don't know the name. But if you have any interest in art, design, and particularly fashion, he's is certainly a name that will rank very high in your awareness. A designer, a classic men's clothing, and indeed clothing for women, as well as footwear. Where c &T has been one of the most coveted names in Ghanaian fashion for the better part of 35 years. Trained partly in Italy and in the UK, he set up his first business designing bespoke footwear here in Accra in 1989. And today he's going to tell us about his journey in design and where he thinks Ghanaian fashion is at. So, Thank you very much, Chrissy, for receiving us Thank as well. Thank you for coming by. See you. Uh, as I was jokingly and only half jokingly saying to you, I've been going by your front door here of this showroom for the better part yes. of, uh, I thought it was 10 years, but you say you haven't been here quite as long. How long have you been on this site here in East Nagong? Well, we've been here close to, close to five years. And... Um, it's been a very interesting period. Previously, though, you were known for your shop in Osu. Uh, when did you set that one? Wow. That was in the 80s. You know, um, yeah, I, the dates by the early 80s, we had, we had that shop in Osu. So it must have been a big wrench moving from Usu to here to East Lake. Exactly. What what brought you here? Um, looking at the trend of uh, customers and all that, and coming closer to them, we decided that it'll be better that we get closer to where our main market is. So the kinds of people who have the taste for what you're producing. Uh, and the means to buy it as well, you found were moving out to areas such as East Legon. So you were kind of following them to make yourself more available to right. them. Exactly. Do you not miss being in a souvenir? Well, I do because um, there are a lot of things going on now with the diaspora and people coming to the area, shops and um, hotels and new places. You know, so I miss, I miss all that. Yeah, I miss it. And it's a pity though, but yes, it's 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 how we, you know, um, businesses, we try, try to follow the trend. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit uh, later on about the idea of trends and following the trends, although you claim that you, you're absolutely not a trend follower and you've no idea what's happening in, in the rest of Ghanaian fashion, but we'll talk a little bit about that, I hope, later on. So let's talk a little bit about the journey, though, because it's always good to know where somebody has come from to get to this position where you are known as somebody who makes clothes for some of the most powerful people, not just in Ghana but in fact from other countries on the African continent or across the African continent. Um, it must have had a beginning, something uh, in the boy quissy that brought it into design. So tell us a little bit about the kind of family background or social background into which you were born. Are you a native of Accra? Well, um, let's say I'm an Ashanti guy. 
but never lived in Ashanti. Um, um, what's it called? I was brought up in Accra, and we used to live in uh, Laboni in those days. And um, well, he's talking about my, my background. My father was a diplomat in those days. You know, he, he actually they set set up ECOWAS. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, he was well, the first appointee from Ghana to ECOWAS, and um, so yes, we used to jump through and fall from from Nigeria to Ghana, come to school and stuff like that. But um, it was it was really interesting and lovely to live in that manner. But um, what can I say again? Um, yeah, so I went to Achikota school and um, what else? That's, I must say that's rough, but I'm not a talker though. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you, you would say then that it was a, it was a comfortable childhood. Uh, sure. a secure childhood, and quite a privileged one. I mean, at the time when you were coming and going between other African countries because of your father's work and Ghana, right. um, uh, it's not a time when a lot of people would have had that ability to come and go with that. Exactly. Ease. When, as a teenager, presumably, you were coming and going, and then as a young man, where were the really exciting places that you went to uh, on the African continent where you were impressed by something about the sense of style? Yeah. Um, actually, first of all, of course, Nigeria, you, you could sense the way they dress. I do in those days, you know, a lot of the fabrics of African fabrics, you know, and um, what type of shoes. I am very particular about things. I like to look at them you from top to bottom. I like to see what you, you're doing with your life, how you, you're uh, dressed up and stuff like that, you know. So that's where all the starting points came in. In those days, was there that fashion for the Agbada or was this early enough that you were admiring people like the fellas in the bell bottoms and the tight shirts? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a crazy period though. <laughs> with all this skimpy clothing and uh, tight stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, you know, with Fela was a uh, was a, was a big inspiration at during those days. You know, the way he dressed and um, um, and the 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 the, the um, accessories and stuff like that that were all adorned in, on him and stuff like that. Yeah, it created a sense of you know direction for me. But was it particularly the the African element of the clothes, say, talking about watching the big men uh, in Nigeria. Um, you know, Nigeria has a fantastic fashion industry, which is not necessarily to do with Nigerian produced fabrics, uh, particularly where women are concerned. Um, was, was it the Africanness of what you were seeing or just the sheer creative energy? Yes. Um... Well, it wasn't only in Nigeria, though, because I used to go through um, Togo, Benin, and all those kind of places, even Abidjan. But yes, Nigeria had a, a very a big um, part to play in my life. Because you see, the music and uh, the juju music and all that kind of stuff, and you look at the people and the day-to-day -day movement and stuff like that. Actually, uh, colors, yeah. Had a different uh, feel to me. I loved. I loved all that. You know. But did you? Would you describe it as being more vibrant than Ghana, or just different? Different. I must say, not that vibrant, but different. We we also had a style of um, creativity and stuff like that. Ideas, but um, I spent most of my stuff in Nigeria because of my father. You know, he was moving from Sierra Leone to um, Gambia and just like that. So I never visited Gambia though because I didn't want to go. <laughs> you know, but I made a mistake. I should have gone to see Gambia too. Mm -hmm. You know, but yes. So Nigeria was the main base for you, and in 
Nigeria, where was it? Was it Lagos or? Lagos. So this was pre Abuja, obviously, it didn't yes. exist yeah. at the time. No. In those days, it was in Victoria Island, you know. So, um, yes, I got to and had great friends there, so we used to be at parties and stuff like that. But I, en I enjoyed that, seeing all the lifestyle and stuff like that there. It was good. So the high life in Victoria Island, uh, possibly the 1970s, um, a lot of pizzazz, a lot of fashion, a lot of partying, probably a lot of clubbing. Uh, but she talked also about going to places like Togo. I mean, obviously, Lomé, famously known mainly by market women, you know, the trade that exists between Ghana and Togo. People going to Togo for fabrics, for example, that you can't find in Ghana. In Cote d'Ivoire, the wonderful things that... I'm not a design expert, but I know, you know, they have this thing of working with patterns yes. uh, in cloth. So what did you get out of the other countries in West Africa that you had an opportunity to visit? Well, um, there were different, you know, the French, they have a different way of life and stuff like that. And um, it was interesting on those days because I've always been in an English environment. And so um, that made it very interesting to see all these um, things going on in uh, Abidjan and places like that. I'm interested in, you know, particularly Nigeria, you mentioned the thing about a lot of party, which is, you know, kind of stands yeah. to reason with Nigeria. But in how did you experience those Francophone countries? Presumably there was a little bit of a language barrier or did you exactly. have good enough French to... No, I mean, I was, I was even surprised to hear some of them speak Chile. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, yeah. that was one surprise over there. Mm. But, uh, you know, with the French speaking, it's, it's difficult to penetrate their, uh, you know, lifestyle because they like to keep to themselves. They like to enjoy their language and stuff like that. So to keep you away for a while because you only speak English. So it makes it difficult. I enjoyed it though, but you know, the language barrier was a problem. But in terms of your sense of the style of these people, because you had clearly an early natural flair for that, um, I'll guess that you were the kid who is good at art class. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably. I don't know. I, uh, I used to, anyway, it's true. I used to like to play with colors and stuff like that, you know, and that's where I think I got my ideas from. So you're describing, said, what people would describe as, uh, or think of as a bourgeois lifestyle. Uh, with your dad, a diplomat, uh, was it really a, a pampered and privileged childhood? Really? <laughs> no, I, I'd like your opinion on <laughs> on that. Did it, it did it feel particularly pampered and privileged, or you just feel it was just normal life, and you didn't feel it was well? To to to, to me, those days were like a normal life, you know. And so you got in the sense you got the sense that um, that's how life is, you know. And you don't really see the other side of other things. But when you're growing up, you now come to know that, hey, this is, you are living in a different world. You need to focus on what you're trying to do, you know. But yeah, I had a good life, I must say. So uh, in this, you haven't mentioned your mum. What, what did your mother do? My mum was a... Housewife. A homemaker. Yeah. So was there any particular burden of expectations she, from parents? She she actually, I think that's where I got some, most of my inspiration from my mother because she used to do things with her clothes and stuff like that. You know, that inspired me a bit more. What, adapting her clothes or she just had a way of mixing up her clothes? Mixing it up. You know, um, if she has to go out with my dad or something like that, she can get, um, puts, up, puts together some some uh, ideas and gets her uh, clothes made up. 
So early on, you were observing the mixing and matching of clothes and how your mother was able to reinvent her own wardrobe and that inspired you. Um, but after Achimota, then what did you decide to do? Achimota, after Achimota, that's when the hair, um, I was supposed to decide on what I want to do. So I, I told my dad, hey, I would like to um, continue with the arts, do my design and stuff like that. So we'd, we, we had a discussion and um, the idea of Italy came in. So yeah, um, I had to leave for Italy. So he wasn't completely opposed to the idea provided you were serious about the training and you decided you would go to what is seen as one of the international homes of style and design Italy to train there. So um, this was uh, directly after Achimota that you went to train. Uh, was it in Ancona? Ancona, yes, in Ancona. Okay, and you went to the P I S I E, which is a, a long acronym, an yeah. acronym which I can't pronounce out, <laughs> but is the Polytechnical um, Industry. Industry. Yeah. So, in the industry, you were learning industrial skills, particularly in which area? It was to do with footwear. Was footwear, it? yes. Um, strange enough, eh? I started with footwear, and um, what happened was. Um, because I was brought up in a different, let's say, I had all these ideas of an African touch to what I do. And uh, so every, everything I was doing had a sense of Africanism to it, had a, you know, a touch, a taste of Africa. Yeah. So I actually, in the school, a lot of, um, teachers and stuff like that love to have me around so you know I show them what uh, you know a different side of um, what's it called a different side of the um, arts of making shoes so even before you went to Italy had you been experimenting with making shoes here in Ghana I was, I was experimenting with different colors and cloth and stuff like that not not particularly shoes but I'll just Experiment with other different fabrics, materials like that, and painting stuff. You know, although I've lost all that touch. <laughs> yes. You're probably being modest again, but were you at the stage of making clothes for yourself, for friends, or was it just purely an experimental thing that you did in private? Yes, I did all the experimental stuff. It was it was something that I enjoyed doing, so I I was just plain stuff, you know, but I never made anything till I went into Italy and started creating shoes and stuff like that. That's when the focus came to me, you know. It's a, it's a sort of very interesting leap that you took as that young man looking for training Ooh. that you should specifically want to go into footwear. Why, why was that? Was the thinking simply people will always need shoes? So let me know, let me learn how to make shoes. Yeah, you know, at that age, I was just thinking of creating. So I, I, whatever you put me into, I would like to, you know, excel in those areas. So yeah, it was plainly a um, uh, desire and stuff like that to be, uh, to design stuff. What I, if you had put me in clothes first, I'll have design that if you put me in architecture, I'll do I'll do that. You know. So yeah, that's that's my I don't know how I I do it, but I I have that, you know, flair for stuff. So obviously Italy and the training that you got at the uh, Politecnico Industriale will have taught you uh some fundamental skills. Did it give you a grounding in how to run a business as well, or was it purely about the skills of shoemaking? Yeah, it was purely the, the skill of making shoes and stuff like that. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't delve into um, 
managing a business and stuff like that, you know, was purely design. How much freedom did you have to create while you were in Italy? Oh, <laughs> I, had, I had all the time to, it was, it was, you know, as a young kid, it's up to you whether you make the time to, you know, focus on your, your schooling or you're going to follow friends and stuff like that. So uh, I decided that no, I, I am, I am here to do, to design and create things for, you know, the world. So I knew, I knew that, you know, I'll be creating things and that'll be my job. So I had to create, you know, concentrate on what I want to do. You spoke about very much wanting to incorporate an African influence into what you were doing, though. Uh, and, you know, Italians have a highly developed sense of the importance of their own style. You know, you're talking about centuries of uh, taking art, architecture, fine art, painting, you know, to the peak of perfection. Um, was there any resistance from the people who were training you to your introducing African elements into what you were doing while you were experimenting in the university? Um, not really, but you know what? They had an influence, a lot of influence on me because of, as you were saying, the, their culture, their style and stuff like that, you know, had a lot to do with my upbringing you know, in fashion. And so if if you look at some of my stuff, it's got, I like detail to perfection. That's why I try to do the Italian things in my stuff. What is it about the Italian sense of style? The cut, the colors, what is it? Yes, the, as you mentioned, the cuts, the colors, um, the way it fits on a, person and stuff like that. I have I, I have to make sure that everything goes well with what I'm presenting to the world. Coming from thinking purely about the creative side of things when you're training and then you're back in Ghana, it's a tough environment and you're having to set yourself up in business in a situation where people might have said there weren't that many favorable factors. So, so what were some of the challenges that you faced when you, in the early days after you set yourself up with your first business? Well, first of, first of all, I didn't have a place to set up yet. And um, I had already bought some shoe machinery in Italy and we're not here yet. So, <laughs> um, so I had to wait a bit for all this stuff to come in. Meanwhile, I was preparing a place where I'll start my business, you know. And um, yeah, I know to me as a young guy, I, I didn't think that it was, was a challenging period in Ghana's, you know, history, but uh, so I just wanted to, it's, it's, it's crazy, I just wanted to do work because I, I wanted to prove something, do something to show people, you know, what I want to do. And how did you bag your first clientele or even your very first client? Hmm. That's a very interesting topic. Hmm. I was living then in Tessa, okay? And um, I turned one of my rooms into a, fa a, a factory to, to produce shoes. But as, as I got back, nobody knows space needs me. And um, I had to um, start from somewhere. So what I used to do those days was um, I go around and pick some of my friends, their own shoes, you know, and this month I got a new naked and present it back to them. And that's where I started getting a little recognition. 
remaking their old shoes as something different or remaking them so that they looked exactly like brand new? Brand new, new. that's right. Remaking, yeah. remaking them to look brand new. So, and then I started getting a clientele slowly, but they started bringing their own shoes to me. <laughs> and from there, I tried this. It started growing very fast because I started adding some of my footwear to what I was, I was making. And because of this, I was making what? Brogues, you know, all those um, also shoes and stuff like that. And then, boom, what, what happened was um, a hotel paint. Wanting shoes for the staff. So that's how it all started. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. So um, from there, that's when I got my showroom in Osu. And uh, what's it called? That's when the idea of um, making clothing came to mind. How did that come about? It was, is a sense of um, uh, your business had established itself because of the excitement that you could take an old and battered pair of shoes and present it so beautifully remade to yeah. people. And then people said, oh, then I need an outfit to wear with this. Is that the way? Oh, it, it didn't even turn up that way. Um, I just had, you know, I had this showroom in Hosu. And uh, I tried to fill it up with shoes, but um, it was too big. <laughs> you know? Literally, that was it, because the, it was too big to fill with shoes. Exactly. That's what drove you to yes, make exactly. it clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, yeah. a way to fall into clothing fashion. Yeah. At what point did you, we'll come back to the clothes, but at what point did you decide to go into designing your own footwear and putting that on sale? I think mean, that, that was my whole idea from leaving Italy, to create my own stuff, you know, to show people what I have, I can do. So before I even got here, I had the idea of creating my own stuff creating new designs and stuff like that, you know. So, um, yeah, so that, that was what um, moved me to come back. Because I really wanted to um, start creating stuff for people to see. I was, I was a young guy, I was in the I just wanted to do work. You know, yeah, so I guess that was, that was how it all started. But was it quite soon after you had you had established this business with remodeling the shoes, or did it take quite a long time to for you to make that move over into originating your own designs for footwear? Yeah, um, yeah, it took some time to to get to that point, roughly a year or so, and uh, yeah. Well, that sounds quick for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, that, there was nothing like that happening in Ghana in those days. So, you know, there's somebody was coming new and he was coming out with some stuff. Nobody knew about that. Mm -hmm. And I started doing, doing this and I was even shocked to have clientele. But that's why I, took, I started with the uh, shoe repairs to, to make, get people to be confident in what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah. And then having uh, begun to broach that area, uh, as I said, you, you then, just because the showroom was so large, decided to, to make clothes. Uh, you have now what is considered a signature style. Well, not considered, it is a signature style. Your, your shirts particularly are instantly recognizable. They couldn't be by anybody else from anywhere else. For your first clothing collections though, what areas of clothes were you focusing on? 
well, I don't know how I got introduced to um, linen, but somehow, some I just uh, I don't know where I I saw that. So, and in fact, to even start that start part of the business, um, as I was saying, the place was big, so I decided that hey, how am I going to um, get into this market? I don't have a machine. I don't have nothing to uh, start in the production. So um, my 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 um, my cousin, yes, was a tailor at that time. She she also was a seamstress, and um, she lent me a sewing machine. You know, knitted machine, and uh, that's how it all started. I don't know anything about clothing, but I said, "Hey, I'm going to do this thing." You know, so I got those two stuff. I brought it to Osu. Um, what happened was I I don't know how to sew, so I asked around for a tailor, and that's when um. And I said, how do I break into this market that's already there? So I decided on, uh, to create a different type of neck style, neckline. I, showed, I saw it, I showed it to him. He says he'll be able to make it. We did it, and then we added our details to everything. And I got my first clientele. And I said, wow. So that's not looking back again. <laughs> now you're you're famous for some of the detailing in your clothes that you mentioned there. Uh, even as early as that was, were there the elements of the signature Christian team, the embroidery, the applique? Yes. Uh, no, those days it was. Well, I didn't have any embroidery in them. You know, we used to use fabrics to put details in the clothing. And so, as time went on, I decided, I don't know how, sometimes it's strange how you come about ideas. But then I asked for an uh, embroidery guy because I had some ideas that I wanted to change the fabrics to, you know, um, embroidery. So um, they gave me a very good embroidery guy who I sat, we sat down and worked out some ideas and stuff like that and, and presented them on the club and to see if, how it to catch up with people. You say they gave you a very good embroidery guy. Who was who was they? Um, those days also one of my tailors because they they work in uh, those areas. So you know they found they found me a good embroidery person. Those days, yeah. So it's almost like again a work of soaking up the influences around you. You come with the Italian sense of perfectionism and style, uh, would you say you had also acquired um, a taste for a particular kind of fashion or did you just come back wide open to influences? Yes, I, that's, uh, I, came, I came back not knowing a lot about, as I'm saying, I'm not a, a shoe, a, a clothing person, so I came back open-minded. I just wanted to, well, at that time, create my shoes. I don't know what happened. And, <laughs> yeah. And you ended up being diverted into just, clothes. Uh, now, you said you became sick. Actually, um, and those days, it was, um, when we were having fashion shows, when those, were major 
fashion shows. Let me reset the others. Right. <clears throat> so, um, it took me some years. Now I'm ready. It took me some years to, <laughs> to, to get into a house I was making the shoes. Then, um, this man who came from um, Kenya, um, Kofi Ansah, you know, Kofi Ansah came back and also came to look for me. I didn't want to come in and he wanted some shoes for his show. So Saddam was decided on what we were going to do, and I created them for him. And that's how I got into um, fashion shows and stuff like that. So, um, and so that's when the upward skill started. I jumped again, I went to clothing too fast, but, but I had to um, tell you about Kofiansa mm. before going into the colon life. Mm. How did you meet Kofiansa? He's described as being newly back from England, uh, a bit like you returning from Italy, giving a little bit of a, uh, a boost, uh, creating a little bit of a sense of a frisson in Ghanaian fashion. How did you get to meet him? Were you just aware of each other's work or were you friends? No, no. I didn't know him from anywhere. You know, the, um, I was introduced to him by, um, I think it was Eric Don Alpha, mm -hmm. who came, brought him to my place. And uh, that time I was working in uh, the industrial area. But, uh, at um, a place there with um, Mr. Pra, who used to, make uh, bottle tops for um, Ghana's um, and, uh, drinking that's cold, all those sprites and stuff like that. Yeah, and I had a place in there that I was listening to create all these things. And, and uh, Donato came there with coffee and that's when the fashion stuff started. Amazing, uh, because you're describing something that I don't very often associate with the idea of Ghanaian fashion, uh, not that I, I have any intimate knowledge of the history, but that it was an industrial setting where you were, mm -hmm. but there was all this creativity going on yeah. in the midst of the industry. Did that always give you an idea that uh, even if you were producing limited lines for what must have been a pretty self-selecting and small bunch of people with the taste and the means to buy the sort of footwear you were creating or renovating for them. Did that always give you the thinking that this was something that could be done on a bigger scale? I was just, um, maybe I was a small child, so I wasn't thinking that far, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I was just, as I was saying, I just wanted to create and make people happy. Mm -hmm. So I was doing, um, just working and creating. That was, that was the whole essence of my, you know, being creating new stuff for people. And once I know you are happy, it's, it, it's, it excites me. So when Kofi, you had that introduction to Kofi Ansa, uh, did you start collaborating or was it just a case of bouncing ideas off each other and the exciting thing of having somebody who responded creatively to your creative ideas? Yes, I mean, that's, um, what was the question you asked first? Uh, were, were you collaborating with each other? Yes. Or were you just bouncing ideas? No, each? we started. We started collaborating. He, when he had a a show to do, then I have to also make the the footwear to match the clothing. 
I wish I had some pictures to show you, but... <laughs> We'll find some picture, I'm sure we will. Right. So there, there began there the sense of something, you know, you had creative ideas and you were working in uh, a creative space of your own, mental space of your own, but there are other people big starting to join the fray and the appreciating what you do, as well as able to contribute creatively to what, what you do um, or what you were doing at the time. Um, so then again, yes, you said I was slightly jumping the gun on the uh, on the clothing oh, right, thing. Yeah. So when did you decide? Because it's a big leap dealing with very different materials: the leathers, the the tans, the the nails, uh, and decide you're going to go. You're going to create your first clothing line. Do you remember what year that was that you decided to do your first collection? Should have been around uh, 83, 84, you know. Yeah, that's when I started the clothing line. Actually, it wasn't a line. It was uh, customers that came in that I started getting, you know. You take the shirt out, people appreciate it, and then you know, I got my next customer. That's it. That's it. It's literally word of mouth building up organically. And what sorts of materials did you have to work with? Because you're particularly known now for your signature linen shirts, particularly your menswear line there. Again, very distinctive, absolutely classic look. Uh, you've also done work with silks, um, some very vibrant, multicolored printed silks. Uh, what sorts of materials in the early 80s, though, did you have to work with? Were the linens immediately available then? Um, uh, what most of this was mostly cotton, you know. Cotton, I don't know how it got introduced into linen, but I was doing um, cotton. And um, the silk, I didn't, I didn't really love because, uh, you know, some of my workers were complaining in those days, working with red silk and stuff like that. So it was a bit difficult for them. And so I had to shift to something else more because I didn't have any education in um, making clothing. So I had to make it easier for all of us to be able to go together. So yeah, we moved to the living fabrics. And by this stage, Roughly how many work people were you employing on the footwear side and on the clothing side? Okay, um, well, the footwear, I had more workers then. You know, I had uh, five workers. And um, the, um, the clothing, two workers at a time. You know, because the uh, Rask was saying, with the photo, I had uh, this contract with the hotels, so I had to boost, you know, the production. So that kept you, you had a, a constant baseline there producing for the hotel, which kept you going financially as your, your regular turnover business. Um, this brings in the the element of uh, the responsibility because it's no longer clearly just blue skies thinking about things that you you see as objects of beauty and that you would want to wear or that you know people would want to wear. And you have people working with you or for you. You become responsible for keeping things going at a certain level and the business element of creativity in this country. Um, how difficult did you find it to acquire those business skills? Because as you said, your your core training in Italy hadn't prepared you to run a business either. Right. Hmm. That's, a, that's a difficult one. <laughs> I don't know how I went about that. But, uh... You know, I got, I got um, 
was all to do with workers. So I, I got to train one to be able to run the business whilst I did other stuff, you know. So but those days it was difficult to run a business. And it's still difficult to run that because you had um, people that you thought you can trust, but it doesn't work out that way. You know, you, I learned on the job that, uh, you know, things are not that smooth. You have, you have to really get people that you can trust and grow with, you know. So yeah, it was, it was rough. Was it all sail, uh, smooth sailing? It's really rough, but we're able to, um, I was so determined that I'll, I'll make sure this thing works. So that's what, that's what happened to me. Determination must be an important factor to have kept you in the business, staying in the business, staying afloat uh, for all these years. Uh, you're nearly 35 years in the business. We're trying to figure it out. I'm wrong. Some kind of extraordinary feat. Um, and you must have seen other businesses come and go regularly, uh, particularly in the fashion line. Uh, determination playing a large uh, factor in this. Um, people like me looking at your clothes and saying the timelessness of what you produce, as well as the quality of what you produce, uh, is the thing that keeps on pulling people back to you time and time again. But you spoke earlier on in the interview about moving to the new areas. So here to this new site in, relatively new site in East Lake On and uh, the new people, the new businesses, the new areas that you decided were your new clientele, and so you were going to move with them. Um, what are some of the things that have been happening in Garnen, the Garnen creative space in general, that you'd say you've seen or noticed, however much in passing over the, the past 10, 15 years that maybe have inspired you or taken you in a new direction? Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not everybody who thinks that um, I am, um, what's it called? Hmm. I have interesting goals. You find, you find a lot of people complaining about stuff that's, you have to maintain your 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 direction, and uh, I must say that my family played a big role in my development. You know, and so I, I'm grateful for that. And uh, the new trends, actually, I don't I don't follow what's happening in town. I do what comes to me. You know, I I don't know how I get it, but I do what comes to me and. It works for people. That's what I'm happy about. I don't have to do a lot of breaking my head and stuff like that because what comes to me is what I do. You don't follow the trends. You have your creative line, your creative impulse, the things that appeal to you, and you simply follow those and stick exactly. to them. Exactly. People would be very interested to hear that in this day of, you know, constantly getting up from one day to the next to see what the new trend is <laughs> on social media. Yeah. And uh, it's that it's the, the classicness, the timelessness, uh, because it's it comes from your core sense of style. Yeah. You see, you know, you have, what I do is I have to um, always improve what I'm doing. And that's what's keeping me up. That's, and that keeps me... Um, wanting to do more. I would have given up if, if there was nothing else to do, but you learn, actually you learn every day. The, the, the necklines that we, you know, shares how they are coming out and stuff like that. So it's, it, it's interesting. So I, I don't know how to stop, so I, you know, because there's always something new to do, you know. And um, that's, that's, that's it. Another 
thing that has happened culturally speaking has been a, t a return almost to the golden days of Ghana immediately post-independence, that Ghana is a magnet for people of African descent all over the diaspora, rediscovering this place as a place to visit on holiday, sometimes even to settle in a lot of movement from North America and the Caribbean and people looking to move back to a motherland, quote unquote. Uh, I wondered if you'd had any kind of overlaps with that return of the diaspora to Ghana and whether it's had any bearing at all on your business. Well, yes, I mean, um, that has been a great idea. People coming back and stuff like that and uh, it's helping to push Ghana onto the map where um, we have the Charlie Wate and we have all that kind of uh, things going on in Ghana, which I think is, is creating more awareness of Ghana's arts industry and stuff like that. It's helping with all that they're doing. And it's affected. In fact, I have quite a lot of customers who've come from the diaspora to, to acquire my stuff. So it's, it's it's a major um, boost. You're still very much working on the level of bespoke and particular, and you're not producing huge lines of what you do. That will never be your model. You're a designer's designer. Right. Um, uh, do you think uh, it would, in different hands or uh, in different setting, it would be possible to scale up what you're doing? That's, um, yes, that's why I created another brand that's called Tribe. And um, I need to um, reboost that department in my business. Tribe is, is ta targeted at the youth. You know, they uh, like to wear the T-shirts, shorts, caps, and all that kind of stuff. So. That's where we are targeting to get those um, people to even, in fact, some of the shares, but in uh, not in linen. You know, the kids don't like uh, our old ideas, so we have to get into the trends of what they are looking for, the African prints and stuff like that. Though I don't have any to show at the moment, but that's what tribe is coming to do again. And were you able to produce on an industrial scale here in Ghana or were you having to outsource the production of that line? Yes, um, well, that will be uh, an outsourcing business. We have to outsource those, uh, that line of business. You know. um, I don't have a big industry so I'll unless I um, <laughs> outsource that business to other, you know, countries and stuff like that. Where uh, have you found as the places that are able to produce to the quality uh, and in the style that you want to feed into the market here? I don't feel that. I'm looking at Turkey and places like that. We are still in conversation and stuff like that to see how we can um, start start our business. What about the idea of other African countries or uh, the trade links uh, pretty much from when you, from the days when you started back in the 1970s visiting other African countries, are the trade links still as difficult as they were back then? I think, I think they are getting better now. We are as I, well, I was talking about Turkey and stuff like that, but yes, we are also looking to Africa to see where we can also do that. But for now, I think we, to push it quickly, we have to um, get it in it from um, Turkey to get, to start off. Then we can create a relationship with another African country, you know. 
You were once described uh, famously by, I think it was Time Out magazine, as the Gucci or Prada of uh, Accra and Gaza. Is, is that a label that you welcome? Or, um, uh, I wish I could. They, they gave me my own name. <laughs> Oops, that interrupted. But but it's it's surely meant as a compliment. Yeah, I did too, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'd rather take in uh, people following the name than uh, me following the other name. <laughs> Uh, so, not to pronounce Pesinti with an Italian accent, but uh, the uh, the acme of style of Ghana uh, is is one of the titles to which you you surely should lay claim. Perhaps to conclude, uh, looking forward to what you've created here with Pesinti Limited, uh, and another thirty five years of the business, we, we very much hope. Um, what, where would you like to take the business and what would you like to do with it in the coming years? It's, it's my idea that haven't fully come to fruition. I, I had, you know, imagined a different um, life. I mean, not that I have not enjoying my life, but I'm saying, you know, you create a certain image stuff in your head and you're expecting, that's why I was working to, you know, but hey, I said, you ain't just caught up with me. <laughs> so I need to slow down. So I didn't get to where I wanted to get to. But on the level of uh, the size of the business, impact of the business, what are the things exactly. that you would like to grow? Exactly. And what you're just saying, every, every aspect of it. But hey, as, this, as we say in Ghana, we thank God that you're here. Well, uh, you know, the up and coming designers who are perhaps at the Youth Employment exactly. Fair in Kumasi hearing you say that would be mystified because, of course, to people like them, you are the acme of achievement uh, and for good reason. I mean, if nothing else, for having managed to stay in business for as long as you have done, which means that you are producing something that people very much want and will keep on wanting. Uh, and for managing to do it so consistently with such stylelessness, you have not compromised on your quality and your standards, which is the corner most people would cut uh, in order to stay in business. Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps looking forward over the next few years to continuing to grow the business, as you say. Um, you have notably, though, recently moved away from ladies wear which is something that you, uh, clothing for women which is something you used to in the past and of course i have to ask on behalf of government and women uh, <laughs> is this something that you're considering moving back into at all or what what were the things that put you off making ladies wear in the first place hmm. can i see it <laughs> Oh, I think I'll hold my... <laughs> oh, nice to know, because you have famously worked with some of the most stylish and beautiful women in Ghana, uh, who one would hope were admirable promoters of what you were doing or presenting it in different ways to a Ghanaian public, even though you're famously publicity shy, which is why it's such an honor to have this opportunity to talk to you uh, in such a, an open and free way. But uh, is it that just women are more problematic to deal with as clients, or is it that the range of women's wear is just too broad? Uh, no, um, it's interesting. In my, in my time, when I was using fabrics and stuff like that, we didn't used to have a, well, maybe we used to, but we didn't use uh, Lycra a lot. 
but these days they use Lycra a lot, which makes it easier to, to please a woman. Because those days, hey, you take you take measurements of a lady, and she goes back and comes, and you know she's going to put on weights, and so you have to dismantle and redo whatever you have to do again, and that's why I started getting tired of that. <laughs> Adjusting to suit the expanding and contracting female. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so that's why I said they are lucky these days. They have they have the light and stuff like that that you can use and makes everything easier, you know. Uh, but here to stay with the classic men's lines that you do and. Um... But I'm coming back to the ladies. You are. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not. I'm not leaving them. You need to go just like that. No, we'll, we'll create stuff to suit them. They will. They will appreciate it. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. And we can say to listeners of Asasa that you heard that here first, <laughs> here on Asasa Sunday Night, where we have been guests of the designer, Kwesi Inti. Uh, one wouldn't want to demean what he does here by suggesting that he appeals to fashionistas. He appeals to people with a highly evolved sense of style and has just been consistently doing in business what he started out doing nearly 35 years ago, producing footwear and clothing of top quality for people of discerning taste. So we've been the guests of the designer Kwesin Team here in Accra at his showroom in East Lagon. And it's been a fascinating journey into the history of fashion and design here in Ghana. We're very grateful to him and the staff of Chrissy and T Limited for making this interview possible. I've been your host, Nanayal Mensa, and helping me make this program on camera and sound has been Gideon Sumwa, with logistics supplied by George Watting. Thank you so much for joining us on Sunday night. Join us again next week at the same time for more tales of this wonderful creative continent we call Africa. <laughs>